Hello, I'm Gordon Bridger and today we're looking at a story in the Bible about the prophet Elijah as we find it in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verses 1 to 21. Even if you are someone who believes in God and tries to serve him, I'm sure there have been occasions when you have felt depressed and discouraged and wondered whether it was worth your while to go on serving the Lord. There's no doubt that the prophet Elijah, who lived in the 9th century BC, had moments like that. The Apostle Paul said, the Apostle James said, Elijah was a man just like us. And the writer of 1 Kings gives us an example of Elijah deeply depressed and discouraged. Though one has to say that there's no suggestion he was ill with clinical depression, as we would describe certain mental illnesses today but he was thoroughly down in the dumps, thoroughly discouraged. And the strange thing was that he just won an astonishing victory over the pagan queen Jezebel and the weak and feckless King Ahab, king of Israel, and had seen to it that the pagan prophets of Baal were summarily dealt with. But mountaintop experiences, the highs in life, are often followed by a fall, aren't they? And Elijah fell in a big way. So listen to the way in which the writer of 1 Kings describes the situation in 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 9. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked round, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled for forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? So what were the reasons for Elijah's depression? Well, in that passage we learned that he was exhausted, verse 3. Exhausted emotionally, no doubt, by the conflict with evil, and physically running to Ahab's palace when the rain came, and running away from Jezebel and her soldiers afterwards. He felt like a flat battery, exhausted, depressed, discouraged. And he was afraid, we're told in verse 3. He ran for his life because he was still afraid of Jezebel. He was afraid even though God had shown his power over evil. And fear often leads to depression. And he was alone, verses 3 and 4. He left his servant in Beersheba, we're told. Now there are times when it's valuable to get alone with God, sort out our problems with him alone. But God has given us other believers to encourage and help us. When the writer to the Hebrews was encouraging Christians not to backslide, but to keep going, he reminded them not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. We need the support of other fellow believers. If we do it always on our own, we often are discouraged and depressed. 
And of course he had a sense of failure, verse 4. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. They failed? So have I. I might as well be dead. They are dead. I'm no better than them. A sense of failure often leads to depression. Serving God will always be a battle. Each generation has to be part of that battle and hold the line to fight the good fight of faith. Failure to realise that can easily lead to depression and discouragement. And that, I think, is what happened to Elijah. So how did God, our gracious God, deal with Elijah and his depression? I think there are three lessons we can learn from the rest of the story in this chapter. The first is that God dealt with Elijah on the physical and, I suppose, emotional level. Verse 5, he let Elijah sleep. He lay down under the tree and fell asleep, we read. And verses 5 and 6, he gave Elijah food. An angel, the word simply means messenger, heavenly or earthly, touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So we read he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Our gracious loving God, knows our physical and emotional needs. He knows our frame, that we are as dust. The God of Elijah is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He cares for his servants' physical needs as well as their spiritual ones. Remember in John's Gospel, chapter 21, Jesus prepared breakfast for stressed-out disciples. I remember some years ago reading the story of James Fraser, a missionary in a pioneer situation. And uh, although he spent sometimes several hours a day praying, he felt discouraged and depressed and down most of the time. He couldn't understand it. And then he began to realise that God was asking him to live a more balanced kind of life, to let his mind be stretched with language study to do some climbing of the mountains nearby to give him good physical exercise, as well as to pray and to read his words. And in that more balanced kind of life, he found that God lifted something of the depression. Sometimes when we are depressed and discouraged, we need the same kind of help. Some early nights, an unhurried meal, a more balanced lifestyle, with time for rest, food and recreation. Christian workaholics can easily become depressed. God cares about our bodies as well as our souls. Sabbath rest caters for both. So God dealt with Elijah on the physical level. And God deals with us and he dealt with Elijah secondly on the spiritual level. In verses 9 to 18. Once Elijah had slept and eaten and moved on, God began to probe his spiritual state and he asked a very challenging question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And the question drew out from Elijah some of his self-centeredness. It was a question which was asking in a way, why have you run away from Jezebel? What are you doing here? Did God tell you to run away from the battle? Running away from our problems don't help us to lift our depression. And again, this question raises the other question, why are you so full of self-pity? I've been very zealous for the Lord, said Elijah, but I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. It was partly true, but God points out, 7,000 have not bowed the knee to Baal. So Elijah is full of self-pity, exaggerating his problem. And so in a way the question also raises a further question. Why don't you see things from my perspective, Elijah? And the Lord says to him, verse 11, Go and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. 
And God's message to Elijah did not come through the powerful wind or the earthquake or the fire, but in the still small voice or as it's translated in one version, the gentle whisper or the sound of a gentle silence. God doesn't always work in dramatic ways, as on Mount Carmel. Often he works in quiet ways, like 7,000 faithful people who had not bowed the knee to Baal, like the seed growing secretly that Jesus speaks about, or the small mustard seed that grows enough for birds to lodge in it, or like leaven, quietly leavening the whole loaf. I think we often get discouraged by failing to understand and accept the way God works wonderfully and mysteriously. Elijah had to learn that lesson. So do we. God deals with us on the physical level and on the spiritual level and also in a very real sense on the practical level. When God asks Elijah a second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? It seems Elijah hasn't changed. I am zealous, he says. He's saying the same things. I am the only one left. They're trying to kill me, still full of self-pity and defeat, until he obeys the Lord and moves on. Notice what God asks him to do. Verse 15, go back the way you came. Retrace your steps. Go back to where you disobeyed and walked alone. And for Christians... That means go back to the cross where sin and failure is dealt with and where you can have a new start. Go back the way you came and then take up the tasks I give you, Elijah is told. Not another Mount Carmel this time, but an influential work among the nations and the training up of a successor. We find at the end of the chapter that he goes from there and finds Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen. And Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. And Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And Elisha left his home and took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them, burned the ploughing equipment to cook the meat, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah, become his attendant. And Elijah's role then was to encourage and to teach and train another man to carry on the work that God had given him to do. And as we read on, we find that not only was there another man, but a school of prophets, a kind of theological college, which Elijah was given the task of training and encouraging. God deals with us often on the practical level. Go back where you made that mistake. Go back to the cross and then go on to do maybe a quite different kind of work that God is calling you to do. And when he calls and you obey his call, he will equip and empower you and restore to you the joy of serving the Lord.